Howdy, it's Carrie the Snail, y'all. Not worried about anything spicy over here. <laughs> Question. Is the Akatar series worth the hype? I've done something this past year that I did not expect. I entered my romanticy arc, as everyone eventually does. And I fully expected this arc to amount to... I, I don't know. It was pretty cool, I guess. Not really for me, though. I was wrong. It's freaking good, actually. But is the series actually worth the hype? I've had my ups and downs with the series. It's not perfect. But today I can safely say that yes, yes indeed, the series is worth the hype. Why? Because of a court of silver flames. This book has everything. It's got combat training arc, relational tension, sobriety, friendship, house friendship, with house, a seductive dance-off arc, a slumber party arc, smut coming out of your freaking ears, a battle royale arc, and giving birth. Literally everything you could have wanted in your whole life in one book, it's crazy. I'm gonna say it right now so I don't have to later. This is my favorite book in the series. And the crazy thing is that it doesn't even follow Feyre and Rise, the main characters of the series thus far. Remember Feyre's butthole sister from the beginning of Akatar? She's the main character now. And it's fantastic. Focusing on Nesta works so well, not only because she's a strong character, but in the acknowledgements, SJM notes that she wrote a lot of herself and her experiences in this book. And that personal component is what I think makes this book and its characters go so hard. Speaking of hard, there's a lot of hard moments in this book too. Enough to kill an elephant. And probably you if you're doing that spice thing. Wait, what? <laughs> Let's start with the best thing about this book the character development. This book features the strongest character development in the whole series, and for one of the characters you wouldn't expect. Compared to Feyre, Nesta is a completely different kind of protagonist. She is built different. She's flawed. She's got issues. In fact, you could probably even argue that she's the antagonist. She might even say that she's the antagonist. It's a risk to have a main character like this that acts like a butthole most of the time because it could be less relatable, maybe even off-putting to some readers. But ultimately, I think it makes for such a compelling journey for one of the series' most dynamic characters. Feyre and the fam have an intervention with Nesta and give her an ultimatum. She either disciplines herself by being sober, training with Cassian, and helping the priestesses in the library, or she can keep her autonomy, but she's cut off from the night court and has to go back to the mortal lands. Fantastic opening that just buries its talons in you immediately. The character roster also shifts around a bit to support Nesta as the main character. Feyre and Rise take a step back because they're pregnant. Asriel is off on more spy missions. Morgan's doing something. Cassian takes a step forward because he is training Nesta. Which is interesting because you think the perfect match would be Amran, since they got along so well together in previous books. But it turns out they got into some sort of big disagreement and had a huge falling out off screen. Kinda wish the book opened with that and made it hit a little harder for us. But they hate each other now, which makes Cassian the perfect fit for the job. He knows a thing or two about training. <laughs> Mainly, we just want to see some action. You and I both know that we're out here pretending that we're into some stinky character character development when we just want to see some <laughs> while this book is defined by Nesta's separation from the night court she then starts making connections with new people as she begins to open up more we have Gwyn a priestess from the library and Emery an Illyrian shopkeeper Gwyn and Emery were both women who were deeply hurt by men and were not able to defend themselves so as Nesta gets closer to them she starts to empathize with them more she encourages them to train with her so that they can reclaim their lives and autonomy to not stay as victims but to become victors and then there's the bestest friend anybody could ask for probably one of my all-time favorite characters in the whole akatar series and that is the house of winds i love house of winds why is house the character i am the most charmed by how did this happen when nesta is hauled up to the house of winds angry and alone she needs a friend more than anything and that happens to be house of winds thank the cauldron for house of winds this is pretty crazy because we find out later that nesta's ability to make things in the same way that the cauldron can she actually brings this house into being because she wished for a friend it's crazy they got this relationship where nesta will be all sad and tired from being a butthole. And then House of Winds just like plops a smut novel in front of her. Boop. Adorable. The crazy thing is that we get some character development from House too. When it leads Nesta into the dark depths of the library to show her the raw and honest darkness within its heart. House development. 
love it. The only thing that I can say that didn't really work for me in this book is that it is very long and probably has way more story elements than are actually necessary. There is a plot with an antagonist in the Dread Trove. And to be honest, I'm not even sure if it's completely necessary. Seeing Nesta's growth with the final challenge of the blood right at the end, that was like compelling enough for me. At the end of the day, I still think everything worked. The whole antagonist plot is I'm sure something that could set up more stuff in the future, but similar to Aquar, I think there's just like a lot of story elements going on in this book that could have been stronger with more room if other ones were cut out. And the, you know, speaking of spice, I didn't say spice. The spice in this book is off the chain. Back when I was a, a virgin to novels with smut, I didn't really know how hard things went, literally. Akatar really wasn't that crazy, but the heat slowly builds over time. But my goodness, this book is injecting smut in here like Cassian is injecting <coughs> fear into his enemy's eyes. It's like every other chapter. This is one of the many ways in which this book benefits from setting up so many of these character dynamics in previous books because it starts off from the get-go with some horny ass characters. Cassian, obviously, and Nesta too, though she doesn't quite realize it yet. The tension between Cassian and Nesta pretty much builds from the beginning, even though Nesta is too busy being a butthole. Once Nesta finally gives in and starts training with Cassian, that's when things, they get sweaty. Cassian's doing his sword swinging choreography and Nesta can't help but just witness his flexing musculars glistening in the sunlight. Starts wearing Nesta down. Listen, me too, Ness, me too. The bomb is for sure the hottest sauce. It is, it but just, it is. Then in a moment of frustration, Nesta tries descending the thousands of stairs. Try to get the frick out of there. But she doesn't make it. She goes back up and sees Cassian waiting for her all smug-like. She, char she, try <laughs> she tries to charge past him angrily, but he stops her. You see, they got that thing going on where they got that really tense, angry energy direct at each other, that pent up aggression, but it gets diverted into horny aggression. It's a fine line between being mad at someone and just making out with them. Be careful out there, everybody. Okay, how do I describe this scene in a, a way that doesn't disappoint my family when they see this? Let's think of Nessa and Cassian as two cars that come to an intersection. They're blocking each other. Nessa tries to go around, but Cassian blocks. There is a pause, but then the cars they make contact. It's not a full on collision though. They're kind of just scraping up against each other, chipping paint. Then one of the cars springs a leak. Gas just, just going everywhere. Then Nesta's car drives past going, peace homie. Next time think again before blocking the intersection, bud. Buckaroonie. Ugh. They go their separate ways. This then starts a pattern, you can say. Every time they come to an intersection, they take turns going through the whole thing over again, scraping up into each other. But they're not getting into full car crashes though. They don't got insurance. So every time they're driving past each other now, they can see in each other's headlights that this is gonna be trouble. And something bad's gonna happen. Like this. Oh, ah, oh. <coughs> <laughs> Got him. All right, now it's time to talk about slumber party arc. A sleepover party with the girls and house? Let's freaking go, dude. They're taking baths. They're making insane requests to house, making it materialize unicorns and fireworks and such. And they're even making friendship bracelets. Amazing. And then the wild thing is that since Nesta made the friendship bracelet, she imbues it with this magical power that binds them together so they can find each other if they ever get lost. <laughs> totally seems like the kind of thing, you know, some young girls would come up with if they were like make-believing some sort of fantasy world. And I think it's kind of cool that SJM put something like that in here. Really fun because for as old and crusty as we can get, we still have those things from childhood that we can't help but let manifest themselves in us in some way. Whether it's Rise, Cass, and Az having their annual snowball fight or just making some friendship bracelets. The slumber party is good and all, but now we gotta talk about trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I couldn't think of a better transition. One thing that I really appreciated about this book is its focus on working through trauma. Obviously, this is a very complex subject that looks different for everybody, but I think Anesta is used as a vehicle to explore some pretty basic but important fundamentals when it comes to processing and working through deep hurt. She's first of all removed from the indulgences that distract her from processing pain. She trains and exercises so that she could be present within her body. She serves in the library so she can focus on the 
needs of others, and through that starts to form new relationships and builds a new community. These three things alone are so good when it comes to processing pain. I'm no, I'm no psychologist, I'm no therapist, but what I know is that when we're hurt or wounded, we have the tendency to distract our acknowledgement of that and oftentimes retreat or hide to protect ourselves. We try to dilute our connections to reality because it might be a source of pain for us. We cut ourselves off from people because maybe they were the source of pain, but being with people is also good because they're the ones that could speak truth into your life in a way that you haven't really paid attention to. So for Nesta, at least, her growth starts with removing distraction, participating in her body, and being in community with others. As she starts to train more, she comes across something like a North Star, something she can aspire to, and that's becoming a Valkyrie. Valkyrie are these powerful female warriors who have a particular style of combat and training. Along with Gwyn and Emery, who are also really wounded in their own way, they share in this vision of the Valkyrie to aspire to. And this gives them drive for hope and for transformation. One of the Valkyrie practices is meditation, silencing your mind and letting whatever is deep inside you start to come towards the surface. This is where Nesta starts to interact with the things that she's suppressed for a long time. The trauma she experienced being transformed by the cauldron against her will. The fact that she feels like she didn't do enough to try and save her father. And the horrific sound of his neck snapping continually haunting her every time she comes across a crackling fire. Silence has a chance to let the deep things within ourselves speak to you and tell you something, which can be really scary, but also important for growth. Ultimately, after going through some of these big issues that she hasn't faced yet, what she finds at the bottom is feeling like she is fundamentally evil. She describes herself as a wolf that wants to hurt and destroy. She finally comes to terms with how she sees herself. And now that she can acknowledge this, she can try to stop living it out subconsciously. She's surrounded by people like Gwyn, Emery, and Cassian who can prove to her otherwise, who can show her that she she can become a Valkyrie. This is so important because I swear, the spice is like every other chapter. It's insane. Oh, dude, ow. Oh shoot, you good, man? Uh, yeah, I guess. Damn, suck it up because how am I supposed to be okay when I got a spice scene like a freaking out of control truck slamming into me every time I'm turning a page? These spice scenes, they're thick. They're veiny. They're glistening in sweat. It's nasty. And the crazy thing is, they don't even, they're not even utilizing many fantastical elements. They're just raw, pure hams smacking together. Just pure hams. Each spice scene is just a step on top of each other. They just get more intense than the last. I don't know if this happened to you when you were reading Smut for the first time, but as I was reading, I couldn't help but like not cringe and squint. Like I was trying to shield myself from the ham smacking. There's just something about reading unhinged bing bong in like words in literary form, this is like, I, I don't know, it's like embarrassing or like I'm scared somebody's just gonna bust in and go, what the heck are you reading? Oh, 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 uh, nothing. What are you reading right now? Read for me that last line you just read right now. Uh, uh okay. Every thought eddied from his mind as she half reclined there, utterly naked, those beautiful, <sighs> stop, stop forever. You a freak, aren't you? You reading that smat, aren't you? No, no, listen, I didn't know. It was completely different a second ago. Nesta and Cass were oh, just- Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard it before. Oh, oh, I was just reading the cat in the hat and then one thing led to another. <laughs> yeah, right. Wait, what? Disgusting. You're not allowed at the bookstore anymore, you nasty. Oh, but Dr. Seuss just dropped a new book. Reading this book in public, made me worried. I salute all of you who are able to read this in public, oh like on the bus or something. You are the kind that has no fear. I do not worry for you in life. You're gonna do fine. By the end, I don't know, I feel, I feel like a smut veteran. I've seen subtle smut, smuddle smut. I've seen raunchy smut. I've seen flying smut. In the same way that Nista is training for combat, this series is training you for smut. The body is capable of some incredible things. My absolute favorite thing about wait, this hey, book though, uh, wait, is what? shut it, shut it, shut it, is hey. something that I actually kind of touched on earlier, but I want to talk more about, and that is the importance of your body. The modern American has been cultivated to have a weird and often unhealthy relationship with the body. We are constantly trying to maximize pleasure, and there's something wrong with you if you don't. We do crazy stuff to make ourselves look away, abiding by some insane standard. We treat our bodies as if there's something to be conquered or abused. We a mess. There is a subtle deception the modern West has grown with over time that I think drives a wedge between us and our bodies, which comes from Rene Descartes. I think, therefore I am. What does that presuppose? That you 
or a mind that happens to have a body. As if you were a computer chip brain plugged into some hardware. And your hardware could be pretty sucky. I mean, it doesn't boot up right. You gotta smack the side of it, restart it. It's not just your receptors for pain or pleasure. Your body is more than that. Trauma is something that could be stored in your body. And it's not because your body is weak or susceptible to intrusion, but because it's a part of you. A big part of Nesta's development is largely to live an embodied life. I really appreciated that this book gives us more of an encouraging way to look at our bodies. And that does not mean you need to start radically changing your routine, get into that workout bro, the rock grind set. No, that is stupid. Do not do that. <laughs> Even that is unhealthy for you. You are not a machine. What you should do though is not ignore your body. Maybe you know what that means for you. Maybe you don't. Maybe it might be worth finding out what that is. For me, I think that means getting some regular exercise because I sit on my butt all friggin' day and my body doesn't like that very much. My mood and mental health feels really good after working out. If there's anything to take away from this stupid video, it's this. Remember to love your body, everyone. Be kind to your body. A lot of this book is about removing gratuitous distraction from your body, which is interesting because there is a crazy amount of- Bing bong, exactly. I literally didn't even have time to utter the first letter. Who freaking cares? Okay, man, we, we need to have a freaking talk, okay? I do not appreciate this behavior coming from you. All right, that's fair. Sure, we, we, we can talk later. But first, we have to talk about the more important thing, Bing long -a -ling. Okay, we get it. Cassie and Nesta are smacking hams pretty much any time you can get away with smacking a ham. That's all well and good. But there was a point where I felt like the mindless indulgence kind of rubbed against the themes of discipline and restraint. <laughs> this book has more spice per chapter than any of the others. But then there is something unique that emerges in this book with Smut that I have not seen yet and that is genuine physical intimacy. The only amount of smut that I've read is in this series and in Fourth Wing, and they all typically communicate one thing through their scenes, giving in to insatiable urge. But there is a spice scene in this book that actually communicates something more, something that you get when you deeply know and love someone, and that is real physical intimacy. Whole face tingling, whole face. After Nesta undergoes a lot of transformation, training, meditation, facing her fears, emotionally laying herself down, before Cassian at the end of the backpacking trip. She grows in this intimate connection with Cassian. And now their Bing Ling along isn't just a wild, insatiable urge. It is also an act of closeness and intimacy, the kind that you get from being in a deep relationship with someone. And even though they've known each other intimately for like a decent amount of time in this book, I think this is still the kind of thing that comes after a long time in a relationship. Past all the ooey gooey, ugly gunky parts of that honeymoon phase and well into the part of the relationship where you can just be friends with each other. You can just be open and honest. And that is the spiciest thing of them all. Maybe that's a hot take. You can fight me on that, but hey, I've been training. I think this book is the best example of SJM's writing in this series so far. It does take a while to get to these heights, but it benefits from laying a lot of that groundwork. This is not only a fun and smut layered book, like, like a freaking lasagna, but it's actually one you might learn something from. It's the first book in the series that I'd say has some real substance to it beyond just being entertaining. It's pretty long, but also it's pretty well-rounded with great character work, action, reflection, and above all, Spazice, my favorite book in the series so far. And I think that is largely in part due to the fact that SJM states in the acknowledgements that she wrote a lot from her personal experience. She says, while Nesta's story is in no way a direct reflection of my own experiences, there were moments in this book that I very much needed to write, not just for the sake of these characters, but for myself. I hope some of these moments resonate and will remind you, dear reader, that you are loved and you are worthy of love no matter what. That is what I think makes this book the strongest and most compelling in the series. At least it was for me. Question time. Who would you say are the top three leaders in the romanticy genre? SJM for sure is a queen of the romanticy genre and has been at it for a long time now. I think Rebecca Yaros might be up there just because of how insanely popular Fourth Wing is. Don't shoot the messenger. But then I'm curious if you would put a third in there or just completely different ones entirely. Please let me know in the comments. I'm curious to see your thoughts. Thank you so much for joining me through this whole Akatar series. If you are still watching at this point, the end of my last video covering 
covering the whole series. You are a real mollusk, you know that? I just wanna, I wanna impart that on you. I really appreciate you guys following me in this journey. It's been awesome, but it's just been such a big part of my channel's journey so far. And that's just been super cool to experience. Thank you, thank you, kiss, kiss. And I will see you in the next video. Peace.